This is Alabama Politics with Steve Blowers, an in-depth interview with Alabama's top political newsmakers. Now, from the studios of Troy University, here is Steve Flowers. I'm Steve Flowers, and welcome to Alabama Politics. Folks, we're fortunate tonight to have as our guest one of the top tier candidates for the Republican nomination for governor of Alabama, the Reverend Scott Dawson from Jefferson County, Birmingham, Imperial Jefferson. He's down here visiting us in Montgomery today, getting around the state with his beautiful wife, Tara. She's here with us. And we're actually filming this on Valentine's Day. Now, that's a good husband to have his wife with him on Valentine's Day. <laughs> He's a, he's a good young man, uh, Scott Dawson, and he's going to be a great candidate for governor. And folks, the primary is right upon us, June 5th. Uh, we got a good feel for governor and all the other statewide races. Scott, good to have you with us. Steve, thank you for having me, sir. Thank it's good you. to be with you. Scott, now, you uh, were telling me before the show, you really, you, you're, you don't really, you and Tara belong to the Shades Mountain Baptist Church there on mm -hmm. Columbiana Road. Some people call it Green Spring, which is a great church. Mm -hmm. But you're an evangelist. You right. you have all, people in Jefferson County know you very well because you were a very popular minister there. Did you always know you were going to be a pre preacher? I think uh, growing up, uh, I got serious about my faith when I was a teenager. Came to know Christ. Did you, early where did on. you grow up? Over in Inslee, uh, uh, just you, west in Jefferson of County. Mm -hmm. so yeah, you were just, born and raised in Jefferson County. Mm -hmm. You and Tara both. Uh, she grew up in Midfield. I grew up in well, Inslee. Jefferson County. Yes, uh -huh. sir. Yeah, and uh, y'all hometown, homegrown Alabama. Yes, sir. Both of y'all. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Sanford University. And, All the uh, way, Baptist. You, y'all, you were Baptist. You were Episcopal growing up. Well, I was born and raised in Episcopal uh -huh. Church, then went to Christian Missionary Alliance, and then ended up at Green Acres Baptist. I've heard of. I didn't know that we talked, but tell them folks where Green Acres yeah, is. Yeah, it's over in the West End, uh -huh. uh, Jones Valley area of Birmingham, and uh, got serious about my faith as a teenager. About and just, 15 or so, you think? Yeah, mm -hmm, and just started sharing my faith. That's and, why you went to Sanford? Mm-hmm. You knew you were going to be a minister. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, knew that that was my track and, and my path. I'm and, Baptist. Are you? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Well, you know, I tell people that's your, that's your label. You just got to have your clothes on. Christ that's, is your clothes and, right. and your denomination is your label. So yeah. more importantly, you got to have your clothes on. But uh, to me, um, you know, growing up in Alabama, knowing our state, loving our state, um, for the last 30 years, we do student conferences. We work with Major League Baseball teams. And uh, if, if I could define what an evangelist is, because most people don't even know what it is, the mind picture would be Billy, Billy Graham. Billy Graham, but much smaller, yeah. much smaller, much, much smaller. I love Billy Graham. Oh, don't we all? Uh -huh. I mean, my goodness, what a message of unity. He's my favorite preacher of all time. Well, he built bridges. Uh -huh. I mean, there's two ways. And he, he lived the faith, too. You know, uh -huh. he, he really did. You know, I, uh, he and Jimmy Carter... Uh, they would uh, they would protect their reputation too. I was told that both of them would send someone if they they had to travel a good bit, being evangelist, uh, Jimmy Carter being a politician. But they would have someone go check the room to make sure nobody was in there. You heard how they Absolutely. would do that, and make sure nobody would take a picture of them with somebody in a room. And I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that was no. I was thinking about Billy Graham. I love Billy Graham. Absolutely, and the Modesta, he's still living, isn't he? He is. He's ninety nine. I get all his stuff. I belong to that uh, evangelical. I send them contributions. Decision Magazine. Yeah, uh -huh. Franklin and all them. I said do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, see, with that, uh, the Modesto Manifesto was really what uh, set him free on uh, never manipulating, uh, financial integrity, and, and sexual purity. Yeah. And, and you think about that in your life. Um, if you live life like you're always on the stage, then you don't have to worry about the, the right. skeletons. So. Uh, for us, though, as you define that being an evangelist, is you build bridges, you tell good news, and you unify. And I think that, in some sort of way, has bridged the gap to where I am today. Scott, how old are you now? I just turned 50. That's young, but well, you look younger than you. that. Well, thank you, sir. It's and dealing with students all my and life. And Tara looks younger than you. Oh, absolutely. She, uh -huh. I, people may wonder what type of governor I'll be, but we'll have a phenomenal first lady. Be a beautiful one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. Be like Trump's wife. On the inside uh -huh. and out. Yeah. Uh, Scott, what about, uh, tell me this, uh, when did you decide, to run, how many years you've been evangelist? If you're 50, about 25 years? Yeah, I started, uh, literally the, the ministry I lead turned 30 this past year. Wow. And what's your ministry called? Scott, Scott, Dawson. Scott Dawson Evangelistic uh -huh. Association. 
So you just do evangel evangelical things for the baseball teams and youth. You kind of do mostly youth stuff, then, don't you? A lot of students. We do a student uh, conference up in Pigeon Forge. We've done them in Alabama. We've done them uh, all over the country, basically. We have about 12,000 students a year uh, that come to our conferences, and they're from 12 different denominations. So I bet you saw a disdain politics when you were all the time you kind of say, oh, that's just a dirty thing. It's one of those things where it's it's more of frustration than disdain. It's it's I'm a bottom line type person of let's get some things done. Uh, and so in my path where I've been, I've just kind of looked at politicians like you got to start getting before long. We've got to start doing something and mm -hmm. stop talking about it. Mm -hmm. did, did you ever work for a, a candidate or you endorse a candidate or anything? Uh, you know, I've been friends with a lot of but them. But you didn't actually publicly endorse them or anything? Mm, uh, n I don't think you Off did. the top of my head, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I would help them if I could. Uh, like Gary Palmer up yeah. in Birmingham. Yeah. I was probably out front with him and going, mm -hmm. this is a, a Alabama Policy You've Institute. You've done him a long time. Yeah, yeah, he knew policy back and forth. Oh, and yeah. I just knew him. He was a friend. Uh -huh. So, yeah, I, I would support a friend. Gary's about you. Well, he's a little older than you. Know, Gary's about 65 years old, I think. Uh, I don't know. Uh -huh. You got me on that one. Yeah. Hey, uh, Scott, what about, uh, do you and Tara, when did y'all decide y'all were going to run for governor? Well. What made you decide that? I'm going to say this past, uh, when our former governor was removed from office, during that entire episode, uh, my heart was just broken. I mean, that whole thing went to his head, you know? It? Well. I mean, he just went crazy. Yeah. Uh, two Poor of the, old Bentley. Two of the last three elected governors. <laughs> Have been and I liked old Bentley. You know, he couldn't help but like him. He uh, he was know, a good old guy. It was a situation. He's been on the show numerous times, and we'd had the best time. Uh, when you when you stand on the Capitol steps and say, you know, God's called you to be the governor, I know. Uh, and you walk through something like that, everybody now wants to kind of say, well, what makes you any different? You know, we have already had the Christians in the in the office, and and I would just, if you're a Christian, and you hear something like that. I give the analogy of looking up in a summer night with all the stars. They're beautifully lit. But what's going to grab your attention is if one of them falls. And to take your attention off all the millions that are brightly lit for one that's falling is kind of unfair to all those million other stars. So when somebody says, well, what makes you so different? Um, you know, you're a reporter. You wouldn't want somebody to say one reporter reported fake news, so you all report fake news. I mean, it just doesn't seem to make mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So as someone who follows Christ, what I think we're looking for is not perfection. He's perfection. We're looking for someone who's consistent, someone who can articulate a message but live a life, let their audio match their video. So mm -hmm. back to when we got into this, um, I became part of just about a, a year ago, I guess. Then. Yeah, I guess it was November uh -huh. of 16 yeah. when, when I first was approached. And I said no. And then they approached me again. And then, Steve, they said, why don't you just pray about it? Now, that's preacher talk for you're going to do it. You just don't know it yet. I mean, yeah. I've been around church long enough. And they said, just pray about it. So we had a burning bush moment where we felt like this was the appropriate time for us. And um, if I, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah in scripture, uh -huh. Nehemiah built the wall. I mean, he did the impossible. And I've read Nehemiah. I have taught Nehemiah. But the one thing I never put together about Nehemiah is that Nehemiah wasn't a construction worker. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. He took, God took him out of his expertise, his security, and he did the impossible. And I was like, hmm, I'm, I'm not a politician. I, I'm, but I'll be out of my expertise, out of my security. But three things took place in Nehemiah's life. One, his heart was broken. And I'll go ahead and tell you, this was not out of a resume building thing or changing a career. My heart was broken over our state. We deserve better than what we've been getting. Two, he had a, Nehemiah had a vision of what needed to happen. And the Lord started, I began to understand what needs to take place in our state. And then three, people came around him. I, everyone got involved. And the day I announced that we were going to run for governor, that day we had 7,000 Alabamians sign up to be a part of our campaign. 7,000. 7,000. So it's just now 
one of those where we're trying to hold on for the ride. Uh -huh. Everything's online now, isn't it? Yes, sir. Everything does online. Uh, Scott, what about your children? Do they like you running for office? Where are they in Sanford? It, yes, they're at uh, Sanford. I would tell you for a few months. They didn't like it, didn't they? It was, no, it was three against one. That's they were saying. already into yeah, it. I can see how Terry wanted somebody to be like, they can say anything they want to about you. Well, you know, if once you get in politics, they just make up stuff and say it about you. If you want to? Yeah, and you got to be true. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, when I, you know my first <laughs> meeting. Let me tell you this. My first meeting about this was with uh, former Governor Huckabee. Yeah, I and, like him. Oh, I love Mike. He's I been a friend too. for many uh -huh. years. And uh, when I was telling him what was going on, I, I was like, Mike, I don't have skeletons in my closet. I'll never forget what he did. Went, they'll put enough of them in there for yeah, you. Yeah, they'll make it up. And he said, and then you'll say, I didn't do it. And they'll go, now he's lying about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean it, you know, that's the bad. That's things. what keeps folks out of politics. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like I that. I wrote about that this week in my column. If you read my column this week online, I said it's kept people out of politics. I mean, because it's gotten to where they just make it. If you hadn't got anything bad, most people have got something they've done. I mean, you know, that they don't proud of, but you probably had not But I mean, they, uh, you know, the, but they'll make it up. It's like Huckabee said. Yeah, it, it's, again, not you built such a great reputation all these years, you know. And that's where I think I am now. I've kind of surrounded ourselves that vet the candidates, research it. And, if, and to me, I hope and pray that there's enough people around us that if something like that does come, I'll have people that will rise up and go, look, vote for him or not. Mm -hmm. But but we know him and his family. Don't say that stuff. Yeah. And it, it doesn't have to be like that. There's yeah. a, as parents. Go, another thing Governor Huckabee said is whoever is is governor, it's like you're picking the guardian for your children. Mm -hmm. Who do you trust with your kids? And I thought about it with Tara and I. We have a standard of behavior for our kids. How they, old are they now? They're 22 and 18. Boy and a girl. A boy and a girl. Uh huh. And uh, man, twenty-two year old. What's he do? He's a boy. He's a uh, counting. He went oh, to Sanford good. to play uh -huh. baseball, but uh -huh. tore up his knees. Um, but now he's a uh, counting major. Where did he go to high school? Spain Park. Uh huh. There in Birmingham. Yeah. And so uh -huh. did our daughter, and she's uh -huh. now at um, JMC, a journalism mass communication. Uh -huh. She may intern for you one day. Yeah. Who knows? Uh huh. Where is she? She going to Sanford also? She's also. She was going uh -huh. to another school out of state, but then uh -huh. when this came along, she said, "Dad, I just feel like I need to be in the state for you." Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's a family event. Uh -huh. Again, it, they were all in, and I was like, guys, y'all don't know what we're about to get into. How long have you been out campaigning? We started on uh, June. We announced on June 5th, and prior to that, um, I was really wrestling with should we do it, should we not do it, and uh -huh. I'd live with open palms going, um, the morning we announced, we did it on a radio show. On Rick and Bubba. On Rick and Bubba. Uh -huh. And... Um, They've been friends for two decades, and they had prayed. A, Rick had played a prank on me about a year before, and it became so infamous around the state of what they did to me that Steve, I, when they were announcing that they were about to introduce the the gubernatorial candidate, I was backstage. I'll never forget this. I thought, you know what? If I walk out of here right now, there's no way they're going to be able to play this down, and I could call them on the hotline and go. Gotcha. And it would be the best prank in the history of pranks. But mm -hmm. uh, it was at that moment I went, when I walked through that door and I announced, I'm in it to win it. And from then on, I've been in it to win it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, have you, have y'all enjoyed getting around the state? Oh, it's, uh, that's, I'm a people person. Yeah, I know. Too. Tell you about, our biggest frustration is just the apathy that we see in voters right now. They, they don't care. They, they, well, it's almost like they've lost hope. Uh -huh. And you know you you can live you can live hours, um, you know days without water, but you can't live one second without hope. Uh -huh. And right now I think around our state they're they're looking for someone that can that can articulate and cast a vision to this next generation. Speaking of that, what policy issues would you like to see change in the state government? What I mean, we've had a problem in the general fund. And you know this, that our yeah. general fund has been beleaguered financially. And folks, our viewers probably know this too, but most of our growth taxes is geared to the sales and income tax are geared to education. And most people don't realize that it's, it's 60% of our, 65% of our money goes to the education trust fund budget. Mm -hmm. And then 35% or 30 goes to the general fund. And all that 30%, over half that's being taken by Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Now, the highway money, the gas money is not included in that uh, that 30% because it has its own money. 
it keeps its own money mm -hmm. for gas. Uh, and as as an observer of politics, I'm a, I, I, I don't know where you are on this, but I think we're going to have to raise the gasoline tax to do, to do something with our infrastructure. I'm getting off answering the question I was going to ask you. but <laughs> I'm going to let you answer it. I'll okay. just listen <laughs> because, to your response. Because we've got to do something to match that federal money some way or other, you see. I, but go ahead and tell me. I, I went again. And just no, no, that's, that's quite all right. I, I think what you, you know, politicians have Going back to my original question about the general fund and education trust fund, do you, how do you see resolving the Medicaid money eating, I call it the money eating monster right. of Medicaid. And, well, uh, what's your thoughts on that? In in your own home and in, in church and in business, you have a budget. And in the budget, you have a three-step process. You may know it, you may not, you, you, but you do it. You have to uh, prioritize, and then you have to evaluate, and sometimes you have to eliminate. And when I started looking at this and investigating it, you and I both know 93% of our budget is, is, is earmarked mm -hmm. compared to the second highest state is Michigan. Some people like to justify it and say, well, it's not really that high, but it is what it is. So when you're looking at that, there are two types of earmarks. There, there's legislative and there's constitutional. Yeah, I mean, constitutional, you can't really do much about that. But that legislative, you got to look at that and say, are we really spending the money where it needs to be spent? Are we investing the money where it needs to be invested? So the first thing you want to do is, I think, a performance audit in every agency across the board and see if we've really aligned where we need to be aligned and really staffed where we need to be staffed. That, that to me, is a common sense uh, approach. Uh, when you talk about the gas tax, I'm, I'm with groups that are for it, I'm with groups that are opposed it, and, and I'm going, wait a minute, before we once again ready, shoot, aim, let's think further down the road. I, with all due respect, it seems like a true politician comes in with all the answers, but a leader has to write, ask the right questions. And I'm going, if I see that we're, we're already taking some off the top of ALDOT right now, What's going to stop us from continuing that on down the road? So what I'd like to do is stop that, uh, that loophole, close it up, and get a firm grasp on where that money can be best used. We have to support our troopers. We have to support our law enforcement. We have to support our judicial system. But does it have to come out of ALDOT? Is there some other ways around that to where when we go before the people and go, you know what, there, there needs to be some help in our roads. You go around Alabama. In fact, Steve, you're, you're the one. Fob James was the last governor elected without any prior political experience. Yeah. 1978. Mm -hmm. well, according to the book Fob, you've probably read it. Mm -hmm. In that book, it says when he was elected, there were three issues he had to address in 1978. Roads, prison overcrowding, and education. That was 40 years ago we got to start addressing these issues and get Alabama down the road. So when you're dealing with the budget issues, Medicaid, we're, we're, going, we're going to have to start looking at that. It's just siphoning off everything off the top of our budget. We, we don't want to be a, um, a non-compassionate person, but in, in my understanding, government was never designed to meet every need you have. It just can't. So it, it mm -hmm. has to be the faith family. It has to be the community. It has to be, as a government, we should be offering, you know, uh, a help up. But like the old trite phrase, it, it can't be a handout. Mm -hmm. So we have to address that issue. There are a lot of things we have to do in the state budget. Do I have all the answers? No. But I'm willing to sit down, bring people together, and let's agree on what we can and move our state forward. Well, you, you've got a vivacious personality, and I think – that comes that'll, that'll be helpful but now the one thing that has been really missing in the last few governors is the ability to get along with the legislature you know bentley just lost complete interest in getting along. he came out of the legislature but he they treated him like a stepchild and they uh, bob riley was pretty much the same way now riley had a partisan difference he was a republican governor democrat legislature but You've got to cultivate the legislature. You know, my first term in legislature, I was a 30-year-old young representative from Pike County, and George Wallace was governor the first time. He would have us out at the governor's mansion, have supper with him almost every night. He would call you on the phone. Uh, he would say, Steve, 
How's little Jenny doing, you know? She do, she's in the first grade now, isn't she? Yes, sir, go. Well, Steve, remember you were a page boy, you know, and we're going to have to have this vote, have your vote on this bill, you know, and be good for the people. And he would cultivate your vote, you know. I talked to legislators like Jabbo Wagner, chairman of the Rules Committee. And I said, Jabbo, has old Bentley called you? He said, I ain't talked to Bentley in two years. Yeah. You know, you got to be able, you can't just treat legislators like they're some kind of, you know, they're, they're the the king of their little districts, you know. Absolutely. Well, you know, they got they got to want to, but you got to pass legislation. You can't just dictate it, you know. If my salvation, my eternity is based on a relationship, everything in my life is based on relationships. And how do you build relationships? You have to spend time with each other. Yeah, you got to. As Stephen Covey and, and highly effective people said, seek first to understand before being understood. People want to be able to express their opinions. Most of us are too busy talking, though, to stop and listen to what that person's saying. I, I mean, that, that is one thing, again, my past experience of bringing pastors, I don't know uh -huh. if you know this, they don't agree on everything, okay? Uh -huh. But you bring them into the room and you focus on what you can agree on and you start moving towards a goal. In, in this area of Montgomery, our legislators, they need to get in a room and go, we're not going to agree on everything. No, because they come from different districts. But what we can agree on, let's start being effective and move our state forward. You know, another thing, uh, I alluded to this and what I'll tell you how Wallace would talk to me, but Wallace knew everybody and he knew their family. He knew what, what your district needs were. He, he'd know, uh, for example, if you lived out near 280, He'd say, now, Scott, we're going to have to fix that road. You know, it's Amen a very that. crowded road there on 280. <laughs> it's the worst road in the state, you know. Oh. And we're going to have to fix that road. And, you know, be your constituents want you to fix that road. Absolutely. I guarantee you, if I was a representative from Shelby County on that corridor from 280, the whole state thinks people who live in Birmingham are crazy because they drive on 280. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, the rest of the state thinks the whole, everybody in Birmingham is a bunch of crazy lunatics. I wouldn't live in Birmingham for nothing because I had to get on that 280, you know. You know, so, so what, but Wallace would know everything about people's district. He, he knew my daughter was in the first grade. Mm -hmm. Well, who couldn't help that like somebody that did that? I mean, he would say things to me like, well, Steve, you know, I, I remember your great granddaddy was kin to so-and-so, you know, and I said, well, I thought that's yeah, right, Governor. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, uh, you know, Shelby did that. I went to the State of the Union with old Shelby the other day. Shelby's 83 years old. He and I are best friends. I helped run his campaign in 86 when he ran for the Senate. Oh, wow. And uh, we've been friends ever since. He asked me to the State of the Union. And I was sitting there talking to Shelby. I said, Shelby, he said, how's Jenny doing? I said, Shelby, how do you know? Remember Jenny's name? He said, I remember you came up here about 30 years ago where y'all kept you brought one of your children's daughters up by their little girls. You know, and I said, well, that's the kind of thing you got to do with legislators. You got to get relationships. Them, you know. yeah. That's relations. That's what uh -huh. we got to get back to. I mean, you know, everybody is concerned about me having a background in ministry, going, well, mm -hmm. we don't want a theocracy in the state of Alabama. I get that. I mean, we, you're not electing an evangelist or a minister. You're electing a governor. But, you know, if you think about my biblical worldview, Scripture says treat everyone with respect. Now, that's the point I want to make, too. That, that's, let me talk, tell you what I've noticed in the last 10 years. When I was in the legislature, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, we visited with each other. You know, I, I had a lot of friends who were African-American Democrats, and I'd, we'd go to dinner together, and we'd be friends. And, you know, we wouldn't vote alike, but we, we, we voted our district. Now the, the, the state party, the, part, the politics here in Montgomery, and in Washington has gotten so partisan that those guys walk down the halls and they got an R by their name. It's like they're in two different armies. They don't even talk to each other. And, and quite frankly, uh, you know, the Republicans have just given the, the Democrats the back of their hand the last eight years. They close your every vote. Somebody's, I mean, they represent the same number of people that, that uh, Republicans do. They've been completely ignored in that process. That term respect, if you go back and study it in the scripture, it means to hold in high regard. And you think about it, if we could bring civility back to our exactly. way of life, uh -huh. and, and here's where I am, you just want somebody who cares. You want somebody who just wakes up and goes, I want to be involved to make a difference not for my resume, not to get rich. I just want to help. And I, I go, that's the reason I'm in this thing. And you know, a lot of, a lot of the uh, Republicans don't talk to the Democrats, but a good many of those African-American legislators are preachers by profession. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many of them are. I've met several of them. I mean, they'll say, Steve, I've got a church over in Utah, 
And I said, where's your church in this? He said, I got one in Utah. I got one in Greensboro. You know, and they've been preachers all their life. You know, they're good people. Uh, you know, they're can, not, and uh, we can get along. Yeah. We can get along. And when you get along and you come to a consensus, we can start moving Alabama along. It works both ways because Alvin Holmes would come over and visit me when I was in the house. Alvin and I were pretty good. We talked to each other. Alvin was real arrogant. He wouldn't talk to everybody. <laughs> And one day we were sitting there, and I say, I, 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 Alvin was trying to talk to me, and some guy was at the microphone, and he was, and, and Alvin looked at that guy and says, who is that redneck from North Alabama talking? He, and I said, Alvin, everybody who comes from North Alabama is not, they're white, it's not a redneck. I said, the guy's been here eight years, and you ain't even, don't even know his name? That's how arrogant, I mean, that, so it works both ways. I mean, you know, I said, the, the, the guy's not a redneck just because he's from North Alabama. <laughs> And has has a twang to his voice. I mean, he, the guy's a pretty good old guy, you know. I mean, he's been here eight years, Alvin. You should have at least met the guy. And it goes both ways. I mean, You've you know. got to meet people down the hall. <laughs> got to have a, a coffee with them. If yeah. you, you know, I have a, a good friend who's a, a senator from Oklahoma, uh, James Langford, and he and uh, Senator Scott from South Carolina, uh -huh. they've tried to do this Sunday dinner, uh -huh. where if if people from different races could just have dinner in someone in in, the, in their home right. not go out to restaurants that's yeah. different but uh -huh. if you can have them in your home and yeah. you, you build friendships you build relationships we can get along in this country it's just time we 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 put our best foot forward. well there's a partisan divide in, in montgomery and when you observe it if you become governor you'll see it uh it's, it's divided in montgomery and it's divided in washington but scott our time's up already i hate our time goes by so fast we'll have you back on uh, sometime before the primary, which is right around the corner, by the way. Yes, sir. But uh, we thank you for taking time to be with us, and we thank you for being your pretty wife with you and everything. Uh, we thank you, viewers, for watching Absolutely. Alabama Politics. We hope you'll tune in again next week for Alabama Politics. Our guest tonight has been Reverend Scott Dawson, a uh, very popular evangelist in Birmingham and Jefferson County, and uh, he's running for governor of Alabama in the June 5th primary. I know we appreciate y'all voting for him. Ask him to vote for you, Scott. I would love to ask for your, to earn your support and your vote coming June 5th at this upcoming uh, primary. And I look forward to getting to know you all across the state of Alabama. Thank you for allowing me to be here. I learned that when I was a young politician, you got to ask for the vote. <laughs> you got to ask for the vote.